This is Andre, your host. I recommend that you study your Bible as we explore more wonderful subjects in Revelation. It is important to know who our enemy is, and our only defense is, it is written. Francois will now continue with this important lecture on Revelation 12. The very last book of the Bible is a revelation of Jesus Christ, and I'm so grateful for it. Because there is no other study that can satisfy the yearnings and longings of my destitute heart, like the study of Jesus, the sinner's best friend. Revelation speaks about seven churches, the seven seals and the seven trumpets. Now these are all Christ-centered messages. This apocalyptic book says that Michael, the angel of Revelation 10, is actually Jesus Christ. You see, angel, angelos, means messenger. And Jesus is God's supreme messenger. Even the title of this book makes it clear. The same Michael who sealed the prophecy of the 2,300 years in Daniel 12 opens the very same sealed book in Revelation chapter 10. From the study of Daniel 12, it becomes clear that the time of the end began in 1798 when the 1260-year prophecy was fulfilled. Let's read in Revelation chapter 11 about the last trumpet. Verses 14 and 15. The second woe has passed. The third woe is coming. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign for ever and ever. The seventh trumpet began in 1844 and will culminate in the second coming of Christ. Jesus entered the most holy place in heaven in 1844 to conclude the last phase of the plan of salvation. Let's read from verse 19 how John describes the beginning of the seventh trumpet. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and an earthquake and a great hailstorm. What do you think is this ark of the covenant? The tabernacle consisted of two apartments, the holy and the most holy. In the first apartment, the priests officiated daily throughout the year. But once a year, on the great day of atonement, the Yom Kippur, the high priest alone went beyond the veil that separated the holy from the holies and entered the most holy. After God gave Moses his holy law, which was written by his own finger, he had to place it inside the gold-covered chest. The law is a revelation of God's character, and the devil hates it. Just above the Holy Ten Commandments, Moses placed a covering called the Seat of Mercy. Above the Seat of Mercy, two cherubim looked down in reverence upon God's holy law. Between the two angels, God's Shekinah glory shone as a symbol of his holy presence. Once a year, the high priest entered the Most Holy and appeared in the presence of God to cleanse the sanctuary from its defilement. During the year, as sinners confessed their sins, the blood, representing the record of their sins, was brought into the sanctuary. But God not only forgives sinners, he also wipes out the record of their sins. The earthly day of atonement was a type of the antitypical heavenly day of atonement which began in 1844 when Jesus went into the most holy of the heavenly sanctuary to cleanse it from the record of your sins and mine. The Day of Atonement is also called the Investigative Judgment. Revelation 11 verse 19 Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the Ark of his Covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. For the first time, the book of Revelation allows us to look into the Most Holy where Jesus entered in 1844. From now on, we will be looking at the last great controversy between Christ and Satan. And we will also be looking at the law of God, which will be the great issue in the final controversy. 
Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with a sun, with a moon under her feet and a crown of twelve stars on her head. Now before we continue with our study, we must find out who is represented by the woman with the sun, moon and stars. Isaiah 62 verse 5 explains, As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will God rejoice over you. You're looking at some broken pottery from Corinth. Paul wrote a letter to this church calling it the Bride of Christ. 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2 I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. What a beautiful symbol of the Church of Christ. She has not committed fornication with the world. Her doctrines are pure. The sun, moon and stars represent the light of heaven that illuminates her. But in contrast with a pure woman, the true church, we also have a picture of the harlot, the apostate church in Revelation 17. She sits on a scarlet-colored beast with seven heads and ten horns. More about her in a later series. Revelation chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with a sun, with a moon under her feet and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Verse 5. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And a child was snatched up to God and to his throne. Who do you think this child is? I think it's Christ. But let's ask the Bible to give us the correct answer. Psalms chapter 2 verses 7 to 9 says, I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. The man-child of Revelation chapter 12 is none other than Christ. You know, every time I visit the church of the Nativity in Bethlehem, I thank God for this marvelous gift of His Son. The gift of Christ is especially for you and me. Isaiah 9 verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. If you have not yet made him your Wonderful Counselor, I would strongly encourage you to do so. He is an honest counselor who will lead you to life eternal. Revelation 12, 5 says that the child, that is Jesus, was snatched up to God and his throne. Is there another verse of scripture telling us that Christ was to be taken up into heaven? Yes, there is. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 20 Which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. What is he doing in heaven? He intercedes for you and me. In Jesus the Son we only have good news. He is the best qualified advocate in the universe. He has never lost a single case. And you are invited to bring your hopeless case to him. And he will successfully intercede for you. Let's continue reading about this amazing drama in verse 3 of Revelation 12. It says, Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. What a horrifying sight. This dragon does not look too friendly. Who is he? Verse 4 says, His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. We have to find out from scripture who this great red dragon represents. Would you like to take a guess? It looks like the devil. Revelation 12.9 says, This great dragon represents Satan. 
Have you noticed that he is always around? He is always causing problems. And the devil always works through human instrumentalities. When Jesus, the man-child, was born, he persecuted him through pagan Rome. Can you still remember how many horns were on the fourth beast in Daniel's vision? Ten. And who did this fourth beast represent? Pagan Rome, of course. And the ten horns that divided Europe. But the book of Revelation is more than just a book of horns and beasts. It is one of the greatest masterpieces of poetry and prophecy in existence. The beast that John sees in vision reminds us of the fourth beast of Daniel chapter 7, the Roman Empire, who also had ten horns on his head. But where does the devil come from? Did God create him? Is he a real creature? John takes us back in time and tells us about an actual war that broke out in heaven. Revelation chapter 12 verses 7 to 9 says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. Verse 9, The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. I wonder how many other planets did Satan and his angels visit to tempt before coming to our world. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God's law, they became subjects of Satan. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 says he became the God of this world. 4,000 years later, Jesus, like Satan, also came down to this planet, not to destroy people like the devil did, but to save them. And on the cross of Calvary, Jesus brought back what Adam and Eve lost. On Calvary, Christ defeated Satan. This is good news. While John was thinking of this mighty victory, he heard something very important. Verse 10, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power of the kingdom of our God, and the authority of Christ, for the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them before God day and night, has been hurled down. Satan was hurled down or defeated twice, initially from his encounter with Michael or Jesus in heaven, and then again when Christ died on Calvary. What a sad story. If you decide to listen to Satan's voice, you choose a loser. He is a loser twice over. But when you choose to obey Christ, you are more than a conqueror. Satan lost the battle against Christ, but who do you think he is attacking right now? Verse 12 says, Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. His time is short and our life span is infinitely shorter. He wants to destroy us while we are still alive. How can weak mortal sinners like you and me gain the victory over the devil? Verse 11, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. There is power in the Bible because it is the word of God. And when I testify of the Christ of the Bible, God helps me to overcome the temptations of the devil. By the way, this verse is right in the middle of the book of Revelation. The great war in heaven centered on the authority of God's law. Satan caused the fall of our first parents when he tempted them to disobey. He still tempts people to disregard God's law. May the Holy Spirit empower us to resist the devil's temptation to disobey. Verse 13, when the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. Let's do a short historic review of the dragon's persecutions. You are looking at the catacombs in Rome. The dragon was enraged at the early church and many died here, some without ever seeing what the sun looked like. 
The Colosseum in Rome is a monument which testifies to the fact that almost three million Christians were martyred during the first two and a half centuries after Christ ascended to heaven. When I visited the Forum in Rome, I thought of the cruel way in which the dragon, the devil, working through pagan Rome, persecuted God's children. I continued walking through the ruins of the Forum, thinking of how Emperor Constantine effected a compromise between pagan Rome and the Christian Church, causing a fall. This arch near the Colosseum is built to commemorate the work of Emperor Constantine. Historians tell us that he was responsible for bringing many heathen practices into the Church. Let's quote from Harry Boer's book, A Short History of the Early Church, to see what happened when the Church and State united. The multiplication of holy days, the veneration of saints, martyrs and relics, and the value attached to pilgrimages and holy places often pushed truly spiritual concerns into the background. This comes from page 42. Folks Jackson in his book History of the Christian Church, page 286, describes the aims of Constantine. He says in dealing with the church his object was gradually to transfer to Christianity from heathenism all that had hitherto made it attractive in the eyes of the people. Something shocking happened to this pure church. The dragon contaminated her with his heresies. She must act immediately. What advice can you give her? Do you think she should flee from him? Yes. Verse 6. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by her God, where she might be taken care of 1,260 days. Where else have you read about this period? In Daniel 7 we read about the work of the little horn who changed God's law and persecuted the saints for 1,260 days, which is of course 1,260 literal years. Who is this little horn? Papal Rome as we've discovered. So who is now persecuting who in the prophecy of the woman of Revelation 12? The church that compromised with heathenism became the persecutor. Pagan Rome was replaced by Papal Rome. The German historian Hechtfeit describes the compromise in these words. Constantine laboured at this time untiringly to unite the worshippers of the old and the new faith in one religion. All his laws and contrivances are aimed at promoting this amalgamation of religions. He would by all means melt together a purified heathenism and a moderate Christianity. The prophecy of the woman clothed with the sun, moon and stars is an amazing prophecy. It deals in a masterly manner with a long time prophecy of 1260 years. Verse 6, the woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. Verse 14, the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert, where she would be taken care of for a time, times, and half a time out of the serpent's reach. In our previous studies, we discovered that a day in a prophetic context stands for one literal year. We saw this in Ezekiel 4 verse 6 as well as Numbers 14 verse 34. Verse 6 says that the earth helped the woman. You're looking at the Piedmont valleys in northern Italy. The woman fled to these solitary places in the Alps in order to escape the persecution of the dragon. Thousands upon thousands of Waldensians fled here and hundreds of thousands of them were martyred in these valleys. I visited this specific valley called Angronia, meaning the Valley of the Groans in northern Italy. Why is it called the Valley of Groans? Because of the unnumbered groans of martyrs who died here. Near the Waldensian town of Torrepelizzi I visited some of their churches. The water that the dragon sent after this church in the wilderness was not only persecuting soldiers and papists, but also false doctrine. 
I'm quoting again from the German historian Hechtfeit. In his statement, he refers to Constantine's institution of Sunday as a day of rest in AD 321. His injunction that the day of the sun should be a general rest day was characteristic of his standpoint. Of all his blending and melting together of Christianity and heathenism, none is more easy to see through than this making of his Sunday law. The Christians worship their Christ, the heathen, their sun god. According to the opinion of the emperor, the objects for worship in both religions were essentially the same. At the entrance to this Waldensian church, I read the words from John 17 verse 3. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. When Constantine changed the Sabbath to Sunday, the pure church apostatized and began worshipping on this new popular heathen day of worship. Those Christians who did not go along with the worshipping of the new man-made day were persecuted and they fled to these secluded mountain fortresses. The persecutions of the Waldenses in these valleys are a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Let us listen to one more quote from Harry Boo's book, A Short History of the Early Church, page 143. He, that is Constantine, designated Sunday by its traditional pagan name, the Day of the Sun, not the Sabbath or the Day of the Lord. Pagans could therefore accept it. Christians gave the natural sun a new meaning by thinking of Christ as the Son of Righteousness. Both Constantine and later emperors, as well as the church councils, enacted additional Sunday legislation. It was Constantine's decree of 321, however, that laid the basis of the universal recognition of Sunday as a day of rest. When I visited this little river, I was reminded of what Wiley, the historian, wrote concerning the persecution of these Sabbath-keeping Waldensians. He says that at times these little rivers turned red because of the many Waldensians who were slaughtered higher up. Their sin? They refused to obey the traditions of men in violation of God's holy law. I had the privilege of visiting some of the ancient buildings where they had their colleges. Let's walk inside. Can you see in your mind's eye a Waldensian Christian making copies of the Bible at this crude desk? He is a member of the new church in the wilderness. He wants to spread God's word to hungry multitudes in Europe. The dragon through papal Rome persecuted the church for 1,260 years. I had very good reasons for asking this modern Waldensian lady to stand at this specific place. She is standing in front of an ancient oven where her forefathers were burned alive. As the floor was beginning to warm up, they had the choice of being released from this burning furnace, but on one condition. They had to renounce their faith in the Bible and accept the traditions of the Roman Catholic Church. They did not ask to be freed. When this cruel cremation was all over, their ashes were removed from this very oven. The ground of Pradel Torno is holy ground because of shed blood of men and women who were prepared to die for their faith in God. When I left these valleys, I asked God to make me like the martyrs who died here. I asked him to help me to love him so dearly that he will mean more to me than life. This is a very, very sad prophecy. God's true apostolic church only lasted about 300 years, but his plan was not totally thwarted. Throughout this world's history, there were always people who were willing to follow God unconditionally. The church of the wilderness now made its appearance, but they too disappointed God and now John receives a vision of the last church on earth. Verse 17, And the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. At the end of the 1260-year prophecy, that's 1798, 
Revelation predicted the rise of God's last day movement as they would engage in the battle against the dragon. John has good news for us. This time God's church is going to triumph. Please don't miss the next lecture. It's a vivid description of this end time battle between the remnant and the great religious apostate church. In chapter 13, we are going to look at the strategy of the devil in this last war. You must know who this beast is, what his image is and what his mark is. A second beast emerging from the dry land is going to support the first beast in his war against God's people. You must also know who this beast is. In Revelation 16, we are going to study about the sixth plague called Armageddon. And in chapter 17, we will study the outcome of this great battle between Christ and his followers and the devil and his followers. Let's do a quick review. First of all, we looked at the persecution of Christ by Satan through pagan Rome. Then we saw how he persecuted the early church through pagan Rome. Next followed the persecution of the church by papal Rome. Finally, the dragon went out to make war with the remnant of his seed. The remnant, as the name indicates, is the last church in these days. God's remnant church can also be identified by three characteristics in Revelation 14.12 besides those in 12.17. Revelation 14.12 says, This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. God's remnant upholds the holy law of God as the great mirror which reveals sins. And they will tell people that once they are convicted of their sins, they should go to Calvary for cleansing. There is no other way by which the sinner can be cleansed from guilt and sin. The remnant preaches a correct relationship between law and gospel. John Wesley explains this concept of the law and the gospel very simply. He says that the law sends us to Christ for cleansing. And once we are cleansed, Christ sends us back to the law to make it our standard of living. The remnant will obey all the commandments of God, including the Sabbath, which is the sign of God's creatorship. And then a last very important characteristic of the remnant. Verse 17 says they have the testimony of Jesus. In Revelation 19.10 we read that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What is prophecy? The word describes any inspired message communicated by God through a prophet. The expression spirit of prophecy refers specifically to the manifestation of the spirit that inspires the recipient to speak authoritatively as a representative of God. Let's turn to Revelation 1 verse 9. I, John, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. When John referred to the word of God, to what did he refer? He referred to the Old Testament. And when he referred to the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy, to what did he refer? He was referring to the New Testament, which the apostles were still in the process of writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And when John spoke about the testimony of Jesus, he was also referring to the book of Revelation, which was about to be written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit as well. And now for a startling statement concerning the remnant which will appear after 1798. Verse 17 says that they too will have this gift of prophecy in their midst. This will be one of the identifying marks of the last church on earth. This is such an important subject that we will devote an entire lecture to explore this wonderful truth. I have visited the replica of the woman of Revelation 12 quite a few times in Franz Hook. And every time I look at the Bible in her hand, I ask God to help me to hold on to his precious word. And every time I see the broken chain in her hand, I ask God to help me to break every chain of tradition that is in conflict with his law. 
Thank you, Francois, for this very interesting lecture. Let us pray now. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the wonderful lessons we can learn from the book of Revelation. Help us to daily study your word and to fortify ourselves with the word of God. In Jesus' name, Amen. In the next lecture, Francois will unlock Revelation chapter 13. This is a very important chapter, so don't miss out.